Hello, my name is Per Böhl. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the to the webinar. Uh, the topic for today is paywalls, what works and what doesn't. Ten best practices according to our experience. So, uh, compared to some of the other webinars we'll do, it will be a bit more opinionated. Um, I don't think we're that many people present this time, so if you, I think it would actually work out if you want to sort of interrupt at some point. Uh, you have uh, the possibility to raise your hand in with the client, uh, and then either use the chat or ask a question, and uh, we'll try to uh, to uh, to answer them uh, as soon as uh, as they're asked. So, as I said, my name is Per Buhr, I'm the CEO of Varni Software, and uh, a bit about our background. Uh, we launched our first paywall more or less exactly one year ago. Uh, since then, we've done more or less 10 projects, uh, five of them live. Uh, all in all, I think there are approximately 17 sites around the globe running uh, paywalls that we've implemented. Uh, yeah, so first, <laughs> uh, paywall seem to have a bit of anxi anxiety connected to them. Uh, paywalls for online media is still a rather new topic. Uh, it dramatically changes the revenue model uh, from advertising to to something subscription based, and that's a that's a huge change. So a little a bit about the sort of concepts that we're talking about here. So the uh, we're talking mostly about I mean the typical is the freemium premium paywalls where you have parts of the content requiring a subscription. Uh, that's the most uh, common paywall you will see around. Uh, also, there are metered paywalls. Uh, probably I think the New York Times is maybe the most uh, famous one. Um, and those, again, can be divided into two groups, those who actually do metering based on an identity and those who do metering uh, anonymously, that uh, only count the sort of how many articles your browser has consumed. And from time to time also be referring to referrer-based access. This is basically just uh, letting through traffic that's coming off uh, Twitter or Facebook. It's also seemed to be a quite a typical uh, way to sort of allow content to flow out. So <clears throat> the first thing about a paywall project, it's it contains a lot of moving parts. So it's a, uh, the, the scope of the project is, is rather wide. I mean, a paywall project typically involves like back-end developers, front-end developers, Operations people get involved. Um, the business side gets in get gets involved as well. Uh, editorial profile of the newspaper often changes. Marketing gets involved. Suddenly there there might be a need to do customer support, which is something that the newspapers haven't done really uh, much of. Uh, so so having proper project management is very important. And sort of to, to sort of to run a tight ship and specify all the interfaces between the various uh, uh, stakeholders for a payroll project is very very important. Uh, the second part is is uh, access, access control. Now access control is the technically the the most challenging part about uh, implementing a payroll. Uh, there are basically four different ways this is implemented in a in a uh, in a newspaper, on a newspaper. You have the client side access control. This means basically that the the along with the web page, there's a bit of JavaScript that that sort of blocks or unblocks the the page, depending on whether or not you have access. Uh, so, for instance, when the New York Times launched their paywall they relied entirely on client-side access control. Uh, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, the Danish newspaper Politiken uh, launched their meet and paywall, and that's entirely done on uh, client with client-side access control. 
That's why Sadex is controlled. The, the sort of the biggest advantage is that it's it's really quick to to very easy to to implement. Doesn't require typically doesn't require much changes on the back end, as most of the changes are done on the front end. However, the the biggest problem is that it's very 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 weak. It's extremely easy to work around uh, client side access, client side access control. So, for instance, if you go to either the New York Times or to Politiken, and you open uh, an anonymous session in your browser, I think uh, uh, Chrome calls it. Uh, I can't remember what what it's called. I think it's called something like anonymous session or something, and and those exist both in 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 Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Uh, you'll have access basically to all you want and and the moment you sort of hit any limit you can just sort of close the window and restart again and you'll still have access have access now that this wasn't so such such a big problem to uh, three or four years ago uh, but currently it's starting to sort of be, become a significant problem and some of the the newspapers that we have talked to uh, that launched these kind of paywalls three, four years ago, uh, they are now starting to reconsider and moving away actually from client-based based access control. Now, the next way to sort of implement access control would be to sort of do the access control in a CDN. I think uh, I think the Times of London actually did this. Uh, so the sort of idea is that that you set some sort of cookie or something and then the CDN checks if that cookie is in place and if it is it replaces the content uh, part of the article with either the, the full content or a placeholder which says Lo please log in or please play, pay. Um, there are basically uh, two downsides to that. One is that it it includes a pretty strong vendor lock-in because you'll be pretty locked into the to the CDN that you're uh, used to implement this in. <clears throat> and the second would be uh, that you have you losing a bit of flexibility. Uh, for instance, updating content in a CDN can take as much as eight minutes. So if you, for instance, publish something that you shouldn't have published and you want to retract that. That can take up to eight minutes. It doesn't really sound like a lot, but much can happen in eight minutes. So, um, yeah. The next alternative would be to uh, app server based, which basically means that you're you're implementing the paywall logic in the application server itself. Uh, so, it's really quite a strong alternative, except for the fact that application servers are are rather slow and so the problem would be that you have to actually scale out the application server uh, layer quite significantly in order to sort of make this scale and there will also be a user experience penalty because uh, the application servers would rep uh, reply to requests rather slowly. <coughs> The fourth alternative is to sort of do this in the edge cache or in the, in the caching layer. And that's, of course, that's what we've done. Um, we think it's a, uh, there are a certain, I mean, it's, it's quick, it gives you, uh, retains full flexibility. It does, however, add a bit of complexity to the overall setup, as you now have an application that is split between your app server and the caching layer, so you have to handle that uh, that uh, that complexity. But so yeah, so it's there's not 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 really a perfect alt alternative here, uh, although I'm I'm pretty biased against uh, towards the the edge based uh, paywalls of course. <clears throat> there's a a fifth alternative, which I've recently found out about. And that, that there are actually a few software as a service alternatives that sort of do the whole thing for you. 
so basically you basic you sign up for a service and you you just insert a tiny bit of uh, JavaScript on your page and they will take care of everything from payment processing to access control uh, and they do all this using client side logic now, of course sounds really brilliant it uh, however it dramatically sort of reduces the flexibility as you are stuck with a system that you can't really change much <coughs> sorry about that there's also uh, usually they will also take a revenue cut which might or might not be uh, what you want and uh, thirdly the security that these uh, systems offer is rather low because they'll have all the weaknesses of client-side access control so an anonymous browser session would for instance uh, in a metering con uh, context uh, render the, the paywall uh, useless yes next uh, problem <laughs> scalability scalability scaling a website becomes a bit harder with the paywall than without uh, suddenly now you have to actually run some sort of logic for every page view and usually you didn't have to do that the only sort of logic you would have to run for each page view would be statistics and statistics would be something that would happen uh, asynchronously that's not connected to the actual page delivery so if the statistics didn't work you would still your newspaper would still be online but but uh, the payroll logic actually has to run synchronously so it actually have to take the decision should I serve or should I not serve this page for every page request and it can uh, uh, become a problem uh, if, if you're scaling especially if you're doing identity-based metering now the sort of the big advantage of doing identity based metering is that that's that's the sort of only way to sort of defeat all the the typical workarounds for bypassing metering paywalls is to sort of tie it up to an, an, an identity so the moment you are logged in the 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 paywall can track each user's quota individually uh, and then without regard to what browser the person is using so you can have the, the quota count for uh, mobile traffic as well as desktop traffic now for this to work every page view needs some sort of database interaction and that of course uh, has a cost and you need to make it scale <clears throat> so next about uh, a, bit, a word about uh, DevOps now for those of you who don't know DevOps DevOps is this new it's not new anymore I think it uh, it's about a concept that's about five years old it's about bridging the gap between developers and operations <clears throat> and uh, especially for for edge based paywalls paywalls that are implemented in in varnish or in um, for instance a cdn or in any part that actually is handled by the operations team you have not now have this situation where part of the application lives somewhere else than in the application server and if the development team needs to de deploy changes in the paywall they suddenly now need to talk to the operations team and in some organizations we've seen this becoming a problem as the operations team might not might operate on with different priorities than the development team does so they might for instance delay a deployment to two weeks as they sort of get their ducks in order in order to deploy which of course doesn't really work very well in a, a modern modern news organization which is I think most of the news organizations we talk to deploy code somewhere between once and five times a week 
and they're sort of getting used to this sort of being able to do the changes <clears throat> uh, continuously and now they suddenly need to talk to the development team. <coughs> Sorry about that. One more thing, uh, with regards to access control rules. There are two things that I, I need to say about uh, access control rules, one, they need to be implemented, which means that the more complex they are, the longer the implementation project will take. And two, and this is the most important part, the access control rules needs to be communicated to the readership. So my advice is keep it simple if possible, because people won't pay for things they don't understand. And in a number of projects, we've uh, seen the project backtrack uh, or actually has to re-implement quite a bit of logic because uh, marketing failed to convey the, the access control rules to the readership. And so they had to simplify uh, how the sort of access control works in order for the readership to, to understand uh, how the paywall works. <clears throat> now, testing is another issue because as opposed to the uh, earlier scenario where test where the, the news application would run on the application server, now it also might run somewhere else. So it could, for instance, be partially running in a CDN it could be running in Varnish, or it could be running on, on the client side. So getting like test, the tests set up to sort of cover all these new, all this new ground might actually require uh, the development team to learn quite a bit of new tools uh, in order for them to, to make, um, to test their, their software, uh, well, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, earlier this year we worked with a Swedish uh, newspaper called uh, Svenskan SVD .se. I think uh, Anna, we were hugely impressed because by the time we started the implementation projects, they had 170 tests written for the paywall. Uh, and as the sort of project move along, we would see from day to day as the sort of uh, tests started to succeed. And by the time we reached, uh, when we reached zero, the, the project was uh, was done and and everything was fine. And I, I absolutely amazed by, by the sort of discipline uh, they had uh, uh, writing all these tests uh, beforehand. Uh, at the tip there, there's a tool called Varnish Test, which is specifically written to sort of test interactions with Varnish. And uh, we have several, uh, I think a, a small test suite for our own paywall, which I think uh, SVD used to sort of expand in order to, to cover the whole, uh, test the whole application. Um, <clears throat> statistics is when you're running a paywall, statistics is something else than when you're not running a paywall because at least, because I don't know if this depends on a lot from, from news organization to news organizations, but aggregates, which typically is the, is the thing that the, that the, the statistics tools care about, might not be as interesting as it was. So for instance, how many hits uh, the, the site had yesterday might not be as interesting as who was accessing, accessing the site yesterday and what did they read? Because you now have this sort of clear picture 
of, of your subscribers and you basically want to sort of make sure that the subscribers get what they want and that they sort of hit the site every day. And the sort of the, the patterns of the individual users, how they access the site might actually be more important than the sort of total aggregate. And that sort of might actually present challenges to, to on tracking these statistics. And then you have uh, other interesting uh, challenges, such as uh, for those uh, who are doing, uh, requiring uh, people to log in. Uh, and how do you track people on multiple devices? And yeah, and that, and a lot of the existing tools might not cut it. When, uh, uh, yeah, also we see that, that as, at least in, in one of the organizations, I think the, the whole statistics, the, this organization had a whole statistics department, which previously didn't really care that much about online. But now that the, they had subscribers, they cared a lot. And the, sort of, and the demands that that put on, on the web developers in order to provide all the statistics uh, was um, yeah quite a, a, a bit of work. And, and uh, I think a third of the complexity of the whole paywall projects was just providing the statistics. Payment. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> from what I've been heard, payment is easy. So that's really, uh, it's, uh, we're not directly involved with the payment, but from all the projects that we've seen, payment has not been a problem at all. It seems to become a, it's a total commodity these days. So actually getting payment processing in place seems to be really, really simple. And but payment sounds really complex. And you hear these horror stories about PCI DSS compliance, uh, but that you don't actually have to worry about payment. Payment seems to be fine, so uh, at least that's a uh, good news there. Um, I word on subscription management as well. Uh, some newspapers have existing subscription management software in place, and for them. Uh, and that that also is quite trivial to expand to handle the digital subscriptions. Uh, some don't, uh, as some uh, newspapers have subscription management software written sometime in the 80s. That uh, that's running on this uh, weird IBM machine in the back of uh, in the back of the data center. <clears throat> that might be a bit more complex. Uh, I think all of the projects we've done until now, uh, the existing uh, subscription system was already in place when the project started. Um, but if it's not, there are actually uh, more or less commodity subscription management systems out there. Uh, some are commercial, some are open source. The commercial ones seem to be quite reasonable. Uh, there's an open source one. I think one that looks especially promising. It's something called Kill Bill, or and it's on killbilling.org, which is the the subscription management interface uh, system that Ning, the social management platform, has written. Um, yeah, might be uh, might be something to to look into if you're starting from from scratch with the subscriptions. <clears throat> uh, so what the customers have been saying so far when we sort of asked them a couple of months after going live, they've all said that they had the revenue increase. At least one of them said that they had significantly changed the demographics of the readership and to a much younger demographic which for them was really, really good news because the, their current demographic had, <laughs> had like an average age of 60 years or something and they were starting to die off faster than their, the, the new ones would come in. Uh, and at least nobody that we've talked to have been, able, have been willing to, to uh, say that they've regretted implementing a paywall. Now, of course, 
there's a bit of psychology in play here, and I don't know if, if they would regret it if they would actually share that information with us. Uh, but all the ones we've talked to say that, that they are happy uh, about actually implementing a paywall. So, if you're wondering what sort of our paywalls product look like, typically they're around uh, nine months long. I mean, that's from we start talking to them and decide to sort of go for a paywall and use our, our paywall solution to the moment that they go live. Uh, the projects are, yeah, the, of course they vary. There's the really short ones have been down to three months. Uh, and the longer one have been up to up to a year. Uh, typically, we see that uh, uh, the business side side usually uses between three and four months to make up their mind on exactly how the paywall is supposed to work. And from that moment on, it's usually uh, three or four weeks before we have all our stuff implemented, and then the rest of the time in the project is spent on everything from back office development to marketing, uh, yeah, uh, all that. Uh, there are some of the projects I've been into that have been had where there have been really, really creative people figuring out brand new business models for paywalls, and those projects have, of course, uh, had a significant uh, time and cost added to them. So, <clears throat> summing up, the pay paywall projects are complex because they involve just about every part of the newspaper. Uh, SaaS paywalls is one thing. I think if I were to run my own <laughs> like blog and, and I would be able to convince somebody to pay for that, I would definitely use something like that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if, if it's if it's right for a, especially for a, a, a medium size or a bigger newspaper. Uh, there are scalability issues to, to consider, and I also would like to add user experience. Uh, access control and security is pretty hard. Uh, uh, if you do a search for how to circumvent the New York Times paywall, you'll have hundreds of hit describing hundreds of different ways to sort of circumvent their paywall. Uh, yeah, and well, you might or might not want to, to take that into consideration. There is a fair bit of psychology involved there. Uh, some people say that those people wouldn't pay anyway. I've talked to other people that they say that yes, it's a definitive, uh, it's a definitively a business problem, and they are actually losing money on that. So, uh, DevOps methodology for the uh, development of an operations team uh, might be something you wanna you wanna look into anyway. Testing becomes a bit harder with a paywall. Statistics are different. Payments are easy, <laughs> and subscription management well. Uh, either you have it or you don't, but overall, payrolls seem to be working. Questions and comments? So if you have any... Oh. Well, hold on. Didn't miss. Oh, well, I think you're on here. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, and thank you for the uh, good overview uh, about these paywall uh, issues and the, uh, the important things about implementing a paywall. What I, what I was uh, wondering about is um, you said that the paywalls uh, seem to be working, and we all uh, look very closely at what uh, the New York Times guys are doing. Um, yeah. My question would be, um, what, uh, what if I am a small regional newspaper and if I'm not a global uh, product like the New York Times, um, what am I supposed to do? Uh, do you have any references or case studies uh, where I could uh, uh, get some uh, uh, information about um, 
implementing a paywall within a regional uh, newspaper. So, so <clears throat> obviously you're you're touching on something important, which which I don't know how it is about the rest of Europe. Norwegian newspapers have spent always a huge amount of of energy focusing on what U.S. newspapers have been doing. I don't know why, uh, because. A lot of the sort of experience that the U.S. newspapers are, are having aren't necessarily relevant for, for at least not for the Norwegian market at least. Uh, and the New York Times is in a special place because it's a global newspaper, and and there's a big difference between a global and a, and a regional newspaper. And for instance, the chance of somebody writing a Chrome extension to work to to bypass the paywall for a regional newspaper is much smaller than for instance for New York Times where you have 10 different Chrome extensions that can sort of you can install and then you bypass the paywall entirely. So, uh, but I can't really say that I have um, that kind of, I, I mean, I think if you, are, if you send me an email, I see if I can sort of uh, uh, provide you with, with, the, with a couple of uh, of references uh, to, to at least to some of the, the the newspapers that we've been working with, and and see if if you can sort of ex exchange some some uh, some experiences uh, there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so next question I think is uh, from Kulam. Yes, from the Hindu. If we have any live demo for the Vanish paywall, so um, uh, it actually is sort of it's kind of hard product to demonstrate because it doesn't really have an interface. Because all it actually does is is uh, show content that's coming from the CMS that you're running. Because so I mean it's rather invisible. Because the moment that, that, for instance, the paywall kicks in and actually blocks access, what it will do is actually just fetch the article at, and add, make the CMS use a different template. So, in, so it would basically just show the, 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 art, uh, the, the article as it is, but instead of the article body, it would say, please log in or please pay up or something like that. So it, it's kind of a hard product to demonstrate. Uh, we, but it's definitely something we're looking into. I see if we, if we can make a proof of concept stack, where we write our own CMS and subscription database. That's really, really because if we do it at a very, very simple level, we can sort of maybe showcase this. But that will probably take some time before we have something that we can uh, show off. But we're considering something for for maybe for Q3 or Q4. Um, oh. Yes, so uh, unless there are any other questions, So I think Jose, do you have any any questions? Oh, we're just saying hi. <laughs> okay. So Jose asked about. Uh, uh, security with cookies. So, as I said, like. Uh, since, I mean, if you do implement a paywall in JavaScript or client-side scripting, you, you can't really trust it 100%. Uh, but as I said, if you're a small newspaper or a regional newspaper, it might not have such, an, uh, such a big effect. Uh, and also, <laughs> because everything that you store in a cookie, the, the, us, the user is free to discard that cookie. So if you, for instance, if a newspaper uses cookies to count the number of articles that you've seen, uh, then all the user actually has to do is discard that cookie. 
Now, 90% of the users out there won't even know how to discard a cookie, but it's getting easier and easier. And today, with the sort of the anonymous sessions that you have in the modern browsers, uh, those seem to at least bypass metering paywalls pretty effectively. So for instance, uh, we just did a demonstration earlier today with how to bypass the Politiken, the, the Danish uh, uh, national, one of the uh, Danish national newspapers, how to bypass their paywall. And it's, it's rather trivial, and it might actually be trivial, trivially, uh, trivial, <laughs> trivially enough so that actually it much, might actually reach out into the mainstream of the users. So, but again, this is speculation. So, uh, David had a question about how do we manage search bots. So, we can sort of actually like configuring the Google bot, uh, configuring the paywall to actually bypass uh, to have the Google bot bypass the paywall is actually quite trivial. Uh, uh, it basically on the Technically, what happens is that when a user identifies itself as a as a um, Google bot, you can do a reverse lookup on the IP address and see it, that it actually belongs to Google, and then you know for sure that it's the Google bot that's visiting, and then you can disable metering for that uh, specific user. So that's rather. Uh, so that, that means that you can sort of allow the, the Google to sort of fully index the content. Now, if you're doing that, or you should of course, you need to do certain things to the clients that are coming off Google. So for instance, I think the, the requirement is that the first hit that a user has coming from Google always needs to bypass the paywall. If you don't do that, then you're serving different content to the Google bot and to the users, and then Google might actually uh, blacklist you if you do that, and, and you probably don't want to do that. <clears throat> so, uh, so it's it's definitely possible to have the uh, to give each user one hit every day for free when he's coming off Google, but for those of you who are paranoid about security, exploiting that to actually making everything free for a user is rather simple. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think the first the first uh, newspaper that we uh, went live with, which was a regional newspaper in Norway. Uh, I think they basically decided that that uh, they didn't really care that much about uh, Google doing full text index of their of their uh, content because uh, traffic from Google was usually very the um, users were very ephemeral, so they would maybe stay for one article or two articles and they would go away and never come back because. As a regional newspaper, their reader base is in the region, and traffic from Google is typically uh, national or global, so it didn't really. So I think they lost lost quite a bit of Google ranking, uh, but they haven't. Uh, but I mean, they've gained revenue, so who cares about Google? Yeah, that was a bit uh, <laughs> sounded a bit like a rant and quite a bit of speculation, but I, I hope I answered your question anyway. Okay, so that seems to be all the questions. So I would like to thank you very much for attending. And uh, uh, we'll uh, make a recording uh, after today's session. And uh, uh, maybe we'll also, if there are uh, some of the questions that we need to, yeah, maybe we'll do a blog post about uh, about this as well, where we will be able to answer the questions uh, more in detail. <clears throat>